welcome back to the China Puzzle News Wrap, where we keep you up to speed on all the latest in the China debate. Looking at the latest headlines this week, the world's largest trade deal has been signed. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership has signed between 15 countries in the Asia Pacific region. The British Consul General to Chongqing, Stephen Ellison, has been hailed for his bravery, saving a student from drowning in Zhongshan. The UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab has warned that Beijing's recent actions in Hong Kong go against the Chinese-British agreement. China finally congratulates Joe Biden for winning the US election, and the US has to delay its ban on Chinese company TikTok. Here to chat through all the latest is Nick O'Connor. Hi, Nick. Hi, Hannah. Um, it's really quite big news this week. Um, this uh, trading agreement, um, it's been one of the largest um, multilateral ones in Asia so far with um, 15 countries. Um, so it's including ASEAN, um, South Korea, Japan, um, Australia, uh, China, and New Zealand. And it's quite an impressive thing because it's the first multilateral agreement that China's participated in. Absolutely. Uh, Premier Li Keqiang has called it a victory for multilateralism and free trade. And together, those countries make up about 30% of the world's GDP. So it's a sizable trading block. I think uh, what's been interesting in the commentary is that there are mixed views about the impacts this will have on the ground for trade. So um, we have the New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern saying it's a very significant agreement for their country. Um, others have said, for example, former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has said that it doesn't carry that much weight in terms of um, the actual measures that it will introduce, uh, but it, it is a significant moment for multilateral cooperation in the Asia Pacific. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I kind of tend to take the view that um, steady, slow progress is um, what is favoured, especially with countries like Asia, with ASEAN kind of organisations. Um, so there is room to improve on things in the next 20 years, which may sound like a long time. But when we're talking about multilateral trade deals, I mean, that is, you know, those are first one and two steps and st stages, if you will. So I think it is a bit of a progress especially some if you look at some of the topics there is like intellectual property some of these things are not normally addressed in some of the earlier multilateral uh sorry bilateral agreements that you've seen with say New Zealand Australia China early on so I think that is actually quite important I think it also is really great to see that kind of progress happening when you've seen it compared to some of the issues that happened with the TPP with the withdrawal of the U.S. And so I think it's a very positive thing going forward, um, trade-wise. Yeah, well, I think people have been um, wanting to ask President-elect Joe Biden about the TPP with this announcement of, about this trade pact. So it's kind of bubbled up on that topic. And while Biden hasn't directly addressed whether or not he'd re-sign the US to the um, Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, he has sort of talked about um, you know, the US taking a leadership role when it comes to trade. I've got a quote here that he said that's kind of interesting. Uh, he said that we need to be aligned with the other democracies so that we can set the rules of the road. Otherwise, China and others dictate outcomes because they are the only game in town. So it does provide a little bit of insight on his thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and also, you know, India was involved with the negotiations as well. And I think the US is very active in trying to see India being a counterpoint in that democratic kind of like if we're talking about the quad between Japan, India, Australia and the US. So I think it's quite interesting that there is their engagement there. I think it's really positive that, you know, countries were engaging with this. And I think you know, as you rightly said, Biden's going to be looking at doing very strong multilateral engagement. I mean, that was a hallmark of his time as vice president. So I don't see anything different here. And speaking of Biden, China's finally come out and officially congratulated Joe Biden for winning the uh, US election. Uh, their conspicuous silence had been noted um, in the past week, along with others such as Russia. Um, yeah. But we can't forget that President Trump is still in power and we've had an update this week on the 
planned ban of Chinese company TikTok. Um, and there's been a delay in that, but we won't go too much into this in this episode, Nick, uh, because we've got, actually got something coming up that might be of interest to people. Yeah, we do. Um, so we've just launched um, part one of our kind of like a, a shortcut to China 2020. And so we will be discussing a lot about Huawei and TikTok in there. So I think that's something you can see on our YouTube channel. Yeah, that's right. And another topic that we tackle in that interview is the introduction of national security laws in Hong Kong this year. Uh, and there's been an update on that front as well this week. Yeah, so um, Dominic Raab has uh, released a statement outlining that once again, I think it's the third time that the Chinese have been, the British have argued that the Chinese have broken the international agreement. And it's the second time they've done so in the last six months. So it's quite a you know, it's quite a serious breach um, from the British perspective. So this is quite a, it's a really strong statement from um, Dominic Raab. And it's been pushed on a bipartisan level, um, which is something that is quite noticeable with um, a lot of uh, statements from Parliament and so on. So it's something that is going to play um, into the, the relationship. And I think it'll be interesting to see how far the British do take it. This week, we've seen uh, China introduce legal measures that uh, ban unpatriotic opposition um, members in the Hong Kong parliament. And then we saw this extraordinary measure of a whole bunch of um, members of parliament resigning en masse um, out of protest to that measure. So it, it is a, um, a pretty striking um, course of action from Beijing. Uh, and there is a lot of concern about that like continuous undermining of, of Hong Kong's autonomy. And, you know, given the UK's historical um, agreement with China, uh, yeah, definitely going to be a cause of friction in the relationship. Absolutely. I think um, one interesting thing that I've seen from it is if you can look at two points here, is that there is a concern with the fact that how the actual uh, joint Sino agreement actually was signed that there isn't that many mechanisms for them to actually take it too much further. Um, there is one or two, but in the end, um, you know, basically it has to be a joint agreement that there is the, um, it to go to the next step. So the, the British know that they can't go too far with this because in the end there is a, there is a dead end. However, um, and it actually kind of links into some of the maybe somewhat lighter news, um, which is the British diplomat saving that young woman in Chongqing. And what is interesting about that was that it was very much um, played up by the British government. So the British government put a real strong focus on um, that personal link. So during a time of very strong confrontation between them in that kind of like higher end diplomatic level, the British were actually very actively um, running a positive course of like, look, we've got our disagreements, but look, there's this shared humanity, if you will, between us and uh, between the British and Chinese people. So that, I thought that was quite fascinating. Also, one of the big things that we've seen coming out of Parliament is we're on the second reading now of the uh, National Security Investment Bill. And it could be very strongly argued that this is kind of a response of um, Chinese investment in the UK. Um, so and it's an expansion of already kind of like already existing uh, bills that kind of strictly kind of look into defense. This is now much more looking into critical infrastructure. So we've been seeing Ian Duncan Smith, Sir Ian Duncan Smith and other MPs from the Interparliamentary Alliance on China kind of discussing and talking uh, about how, if anything, this bill actually hasn't gone far enough. So the Henry Jackson Society put something out, um, put a report out on it. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a story that's gonna keep on building as more people realize the kind of impact it could have um, with China relations. Well, thanks, Nick. I think that's all we've got time for for this week, but uh, stay tuned for our latest episode of the China Puzzle where we interview uh, the UK MP Richard Graham, who's head of the all-party parliamentary group on China, as well as leading China scholar Professor Kerry Brown from the Lao China Institute. Uh, we'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.